Okay, well, hi everyone. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Liam Hydra here today with another episode of Presenting Champions for the Simply Inspired podcast. Today, joined by Ben Apple Boxer and Glove Boxer John Collier, a legend in the world of unlicensed boxing, Bernacle Boxing. He's also a trainer and coach as well. Um, we're going to be finding out more about his story today from BKB coach to BKB fighter, I believe is how that story went. We're going to be delving into the mindset that it takes to compete in one of the world's toughest sports, or two of the world's toughest sports, bare boxing and glove boxing as well. So we've got some great things to talk about. And mate, like I just said, thank you very much for coming on the show. And it's great to have you here today. You're very welcome, mate. How are you? Yeah, doing good. Thank you. Doing real good. Oh, good. Good, uh, good. Like I, like I was saying before we were recording, hope you're well, the family's all good and everything. Um, so we got some good things to... Uh, to touch on um because you've been a busy man you've had a lot of fights you've been coaching training you've been doing a lot of things but before we get into all of that let's go back in time just for a minute and talk about uh where you grew up what your early years were like and particularly um if you were involved in any sports from an early age or if that was something that came later right okay um sports not really i used i remember a lot when i was young i used to play a lot of football because I grew up in like, I came of age in like the early to the mid nineties. So I'm from the northwest of England. And obviously, Manchester United were dominating everything. So I had the Black Man United kit. I used to go out every Saturday, Saturday afternoon, Saturday morning. I was out Saturday morning, eight o'clock Saturday morning, playing football and stuff like that. So um, boxing didn't really t- enter my stratosphere until I was probably about 12, 13, something like that. That's when boxing really came about. Well, okay, very cool. So you started boxing at that age, obviously, with the amateur side of things. Share with us a little bit about uh, just some brief highlights about what that time was like when you first got into boxing. Was it sort of love at first sight? You just enjoyed it straight away? Or did it take you a little while to sort of get in the swim of things with uh, boxing in those early years? With me and boxing, I, I went to it when I was about 12. And I, stay, I stayed with it probably for about 12 months. I didn't have a fight or anything. I was just in the gym. Uh, Martin Murray was in the gym at the time because obviously he trained with John Wyatt at Wigan ABC for a while. Um, but then I just fell out of love with it and I just became a teenager, became a 14, 15, 16 year old teenager, dabbling with cigs and beer and women and all the kind of stuff that all teenagers do, particularly in the northwest of England. <laughs> but um, I only really went back to boxing properly when I'd, I'd been through a rough time when I was about 25, something like that. I um I only I didn't have my first fight, I was twenty seven. So I crammed all them them fights in, in the last eleven, twelve years. How old am I now? Thirty eight. Last eleven or twelve years, yeah. So I've been super busy. Yeah, you sure have. You've been a very busy man. We'll get to that in, in just a minute now. But uh before we do, so obviously there was that sort of long gap there. What was it that made you go back to boxing, uh, if you don't mind touching on this, in terms of being out of it that many years? You obviously got the bug back from from somewhere. Yeah, I just, I always had a punch bag in the garage. Excuse me. I always had a punch bag in the garage. I always just knock a bag about. Um, but I went back to it with me, my first coach, Paul. He took me on the pads and stuff like that. And he, um, I, just, I just went back into it that way, just to get fit, just to get healthy. Quite... I had quite a lot of pent up aggression as well. Do you know what I mean? It was quite an angsty kind of uh, in my early twenties. So it was just a good way to punch stuff and not get nicked for it, basically. <laughs> Absolutely. So it was all good. Yeah, yeah. Natural outlet. I, I feel you on. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, it's healthy as well. It's it's physically, sorry, physically and mentally healthy as well with the sport. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Hundred percent. I don't know how much you can say about this, but during that time you were out of boxing, was there much street fighting going on and all that type of thing? Or were you mostly staying away from that? Not really. I was quite soft, me, really. You know, I was quite soft and quite timid and quite uh, quite an anxious kind of teenager. But I was, I was confident. You know, I was like, I was always one of the lads and with the, with the girls and all that. But if it came to like a confrontation or a particularly physical confrontation, I, I couldn't find my way out of a wet paper bag, really. Sometimes I've got older and I thought, hang on a minute, I can I can do something with these. Do you know what I mean? I can, I can do a bit. Do you know what I mean? I've got the balance. I've got a bit of power. I've got, you know, I've got... If it, if it came to a fight when I was 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, I, I was on my toes, mate. 
to be honest, I was probably a bit stoned, so <laughs> so I probably got out of my way that way. Yeah, well, that makes sense. But still, you know, with the fighting side of things, you, you know, you'd never think it looking at you now, but it makes sense. It does make a lot of sense. So, yes, yeah, so you got back into it in your 20s. Um, yeah. I think it's cool as well, because obviously some people say that's a late age and everything. I think it's very cool because it sort of shows age is just a number in a way. Um, yeah. What's about that time, basically, particularly when you were first starting, I guess, doing some amateur fights first, and then you went into the... Uh, the unlicensed white collar, whatever you want to call it, that scene later it, on. It was the other way around me because I've only had one amateur fight. I've only ever had one amateur boxing match and I didn't, I'll, I'll just go forward and I'll go back a little bit. I didn't like the, how regimented it was. It's like you put your head guard on at this point, you put your gloves on at this point, your gum shield has to be this colour, your wraps have to be this brand, your gloves have to be this brand, you have to weigh 0.2. I was like, ah, oh, it's not for me. I'm, I'm quite strict and I'm quite regimented with myself, but, I have a bit of authority issues, really, and it's like, don't don't tell me what colour my gum shield's out to be. Do you know what I mean? It's a gum shield. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's got to be white and it can't hide any blood. It, it, it wasn't for me. And then, more so with the advent of social media and the internet exploding like it has, it's become how obvious amateur, bo- how corrupt amateur boxing is. It, it's so bent, and they're taking... They're taking, taking dreams away from children because the face doesn't fit a postcode. You know what I mean? They're not from the right postcode or the face doesn't fit or the wrong club or... It, it's just... We have an amateur team up at... Uh, I'm not going to say too much because we do have an amateur team at the gym where I work and train out of, but I, I, I don't like it. I don't... The thing is, with unlicensed boxing, at least you know... Right, I've not sold any tickets and I'm in Scotland against a Scottish fighter. I need a knockout for a draw. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Whereas with amateur boxing, it's meant to be an even playing field and you get GB squad, Olympic squad, and you go to the uh, English Institute of Sport and all that. And it's not. It, it, it's as bent as pro boxing and amateur bo- um, unlicensed boxing put together. So that's my little rant on that. And I, 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 try, I, try, I do try and be a little bit reserved with amateur boxing and my thoughts on it because we do have a team up at ours. And the good coaches and the good fighters, good lads, do you know what I mean? Beautiful people. It's just the system. You know, and the everything behind it, I, I, I don't, I don't particularly like it. But um, sorry, I rewound back a couple of years now. But um, I was, I started off in the unlicensed. I had, I probably had forty, fifty unlicensed fights before I even contemplated with the amateurs because I went to the amateurs because you have to have five amateur fights. And I thought I'll go pro just as a journeyman. Obviously, I was in my early thirties and I knew, you know, I wasn't going to be boxing Canelo in. Mexico at 30 odd years of age I mean I'm not daft but I thought I love boxing I'm, I'm tough as they come I can make a few quid going on the road every couple of weeks so that was me uh, thing of going to amateurs but I didn't take to it so unlicensed boxing has always been mine really it's always what I've ever done yeah absolutely and how many did you say altogether, like um, unlicensed and all that fights you've had all in all I've had about 100 odd fights in total I've lost count but when I say 100 nod fights, I had a bit of an argument with someone the other day. It's like, you've not had 100 nod fights. When I say 100 nod fights, I've done like exhibitions and I've done standings under a false name, stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Where you, you, you let the guy, say it's a charity event and there's some guy who sold 40 tickets to his mum and dad and his sister and they need someone who's my weight. I just go over and give him the rounds. Do you know what I mean? I let him have it. The way I saw it at that point was I've had my career. This is his night. Do you know what I mean? I, I could respectfully, we're not saying arrogant, I could knock him out in 30 seconds. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But it's not my night. It's your night. It's a charity night. You sold tickets to your mum and dad. You want to have your hand raised in front of your grandma. You have that. You know, I've probably done 30 of them. <laughs> Quick bit of cash. Come on, treat the kids to a Mackey's. Go to bed. Yeah. Good karma. The way I, I always look at it was good karma. I've had my day. Let someone else have their day. That was the way I always just look at it. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Can't fault it at all. I get where you're coming from. We all know. It uh, happens in it happens in all walks of boxing. People tell you it doesn't, but it does. Well, of course it does. Yeah, of course it does. I mean, uh, the pro game as well. You know, it's one of those if you know, you know, and everything. I know. Yeah. So uh, that side of things going on. So. Looking at it from a different point of view, though, because that was sort of later on, you, you had your career, that's cool. What were some of your favourite fights in terms of looking at it from the more competitive point of view? Because the only way I can think to narrow down as many as you've had is just to sort of think about the ones that have stayed with you, that you look back on more fondly. Maybe there's a handful that come out of it. 
my favourite fight ever, what I argue was my best performance. I lost the fight. I lost I lost every single round of the fight, but I beg your pardon. I was up in Aberdeen. It was boxing a guy called Mark Kerr. Uh, Who's one? He's one of my friends now. I've been up and spa, I've been up to Glasgow and spared with him since. We we we're good, pretty good friends. Only online, obviously, but we chat regular. Um, I lost the fight. I probably lost every round. Maybe one, maybe one a share of a couple of rounds, five round fight. But it was, it was more the period of it. It was the eight weeks. Of, you know, my girlfriend at the time, my corner team, and going up to Aberdeen, and it was we would get a hotel, and it was just it was just a really good like two month period. That that time, and it was a good performance from me. I wasn't. I, I boxed Mark twice, and he beat me convincingly both times. I just wasn't good enough to beat him. Do you know what I mean? It's just it happens. Some fighters just aren't good enough to beat other fighters. But I gave a good account of myself, and that was that. I was happy with it. That is, that's a favourite. Yeah, I love asking that question because you never know which one's going to come back out. Of yeah, all the amount yeah. that you've had. Um, you know, you could argue when I won me when I won when I beat a local rival who I boxed around here. Could argue when I beat him was one of my favourite fights, but I'd be lying to you. Like I said, yeah, it was when I knocked out Craig, and I'd be lying to you. I loved that weekend in Aberdeen. I loved that weekend. I come on with a big cut over my eye, and my nose is all over my face. And we had a got a big standing ovation at the end from all the crowd. It was it was a good weekend, and it was it was nice to share it with someone like Mark, not someone who's an idiot. Do you know what I mean? Like ah, ha, I beat you. He just like touched my glove at the end and gave me a hug. He went, "You are on tough." Martha Fokker. I said, thank you very much. I'll take that with me. So, yeah. Well, that's the way it should be, man. Mutual respect. People putting it on the line and everything. Of course. It's what the fans want to see. And, it's only a sport. Yeah. It's only a sport. It's just like chess, but it hurts a bit. That's all. Yeah, man. It's a good way of looking at it. I like that. Yeah, it's only a sport. It's only a sport. Yeah. And on the subject of that, because you were saying about your eye and your nose and all that type of thing, which ones stand out of being some of the uh, the toughest fights you've had gloved? Where they not so much. I mean, obviously it can be power and everything, but it can also be somebody who was technically, you know, like what you were saying about Mark, like yeah, good or something going on outside the, the ring in your life. You had to sort of push through to win the fight or whatever. Like it comes in different forms. You know what I mean? And uh, which one of the, for that? Some of the toughest times I spent in the ring, I was a sparring partner for a professional box called Denton Vassell I don't know if you've heard of him I have, he, yeah. won the, uh, he won the European and the Commonwealth box Frankie Gavin for the British as well I was his mate when he when Frankie Gavin broke his jaw he had 12 months out then I was his main sparring partner for his comeback fight because I was training up at Hatton Gym at the time and that's where he was training at Ricky's Gym in uh, Hyde in Manchester and his coach Bob Shannon was like you are perfect sparring for Craig who is fighting he was like can you come over twice a week and give him rounds I was like I was like Honoured, do you know what I mean? It was in Ricky Atten's gym with a pro team. I had a corn, little corner team and everything. I was like, absolutely, I'll do it for nothing. Do you know what I mean? Pay me, pay me my fuel money, I'll be happy with that. But they were some of the toughest times I spent in a boxing ring because denting it so hard, man. He broke my ribs, he did my nose, he cut my eye. But it was the same again with the respect thing. He said the same at the end. He said, Everyone always says it about me, and I'll openly admit it. You're not the best fighter in the world, you're not, my John, but my God, you're tough. Like, thank you much. Thank you very much. I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a real compliment, man. That's a good deal, you know? I like it. There's some pro boxers where pro boxers can't put you over. Do you know what I mean? Guys who won European and Commonwealth titles, and they're going, you tough son of a bitch. I'm like, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that made your day, made your week, made your month. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I like it, you know. But it's true. I mean, like I say, you look at some of your fights and everything, you can see that, man. I mean, it's, it's 100% true. Any other sparring stories that stand out to you uh, before we move on into coaching and into a few other things? Yeah. Um, sparring stories, not really. I've not, I've not, I've not travelled a lot, really, because I have my own fight team and I've done for the last six or seven years. We just kind of spar internally, rightly or wrongly. A lot of people say you should get about, but... I've got southpaws, I've got tall fighters, counter punchers, aggressive fighters, short fighters, heavy fighters. Like I've got all fighters in the gym. So we can always find someone who say, beg your pardon, say I'm boxing someone who's shorter, aggressive, stocky. I've got someone in the gym for it. Do you know what I mean? So I've got, I've got, I'm dead lucky with where I am because I've got a, such a good team and I've got a good, I've got to get everything. I've got a good team. I've got a good, it's all good. I've got anything I need on tap whenever I want it in terms of fighting. Yeah, well, that's the way to do it, man. That's the way, you know, have it all around. Yeah, 
So with that in mind, um, with the whole training, coaching, whatever you want to call it, that side of things, obviously I'm aware you do a lot with that. You'll have to bring me up to speed on the uh, on the timeline of that a little bit. Okay. I know it's something you do a lot, a lot with. So tell us a little bit about how you started with that, how it's going, just anything you'd like to share about the coaching side so of things. Coaching started when I was still very much an active glove fighter. I was it was more, it wasn't like John's head coach, but it was like I had about four, three or four of us used to train together. And it was just down to me to plan the sessions. So John's the best pad man. John, John's got the round timer. John, you know, I just had everything, all the equipment and everything. So it just kind of came that I was running the sessions. And then I'm at Majestic Gym now. I've been there, been there nearly 10 years now at Majestic Gym coaching now. Um, I went to Kevin Harper, who owns Majestic Gym in Wigan. And I said, we've not got any money. So we can't pay. I said, but can we use your gym? We'll we'll go out in your gear. We'll use your t-shirts. We'll use you know we'll, we'll, we're out through two, three, four times a, a week, um, a month, at different shows. So we'll just always have your gear on. And he said, yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, and he was watching me working with my fighters, and he just kind of said, he said, why don't you just take over the boxing, take over the boxing here, and I was it is. And I said, all right. And it just stemmed from there. And then. D- Obviously, Kev's really good at marketing because it's his business. Majestic Jim is, is what pays his mortgage and pays his bills and feeds his children. So he markets it and then they come to me and I get fighters and some guys just come for fitness, just come for hip pads and get some weight off. Some guys want to be a world champion. Some guys just want to have a knockabout in the gym, have a spa. We've got all aspects of it in, in the gym. So that's, how, that's pretty much how coaching started. I just fell into it. My hobby accidentally became my job. Yeah, well, that's the way to do it, man. You've got to love what you do, you know. I mean, I always say life is uh, it's too short for anything else. You obviously enjoy what you do. So what do you like most about coaching and, you know, being around fighters in that way, helping them and, you know, the pads and everything you said there? I mean, just to get a feel for your, your favourite parts of the job. Basically. One of the most rewarding things about coaching is when you, you show someone something on the pads on a Tuesday and say, right, you're sparring Friday and you'll go, try that now, Connor. Step across now, and they do it, and it works. It's like, it's rewarding for them. It's rewarding for me to watch them do it, because they'll go, Jesus, it works, but it's rewarding to me. And it's, <laughs> without sounding like egotistical, it's a bit of an ego boost, because I go, hang on a minute, I, I know what I'm on about here. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So when you see something, that that's always rewarding. Obviously, when the lads win the fights and stuff like that, that's always really good, but that's obviously like top of the mountain, top of the metaphorical mountain of coaching when the lads win the fights but little little wins like that in the gym John I've lost three pounds this week thanks mate somebody who's not somebody who's not a fighter lost three pounds this week mate oh nice one mate treat yourself to a twirl <laughs> yeah well that's, that's the beauty isn't it that's the beauty of boxing I always say because it even though it's an aggressive sport. It heals people. I know it sounds weird, but I always say you see a kid come in the gym, you know, Absolutely. really shy or something, not talking to anybody, whatever. Been there a few weeks to talk to everybody. They come out their shell, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weight loss, mental health, physical health. I mean, it's a community. Boxing yeah. is a community. Yeah, yeah. Everyone. If, you, if you're willing to put yourself there in the, in the center of it and just say hello to someone, excuse me, how do I wrap my hands? You know, if you're willing to do that, somebody will take you under the wing. It can be daunting walking into a boxing gym, but it's something I, I can't relate to because I'm, I've always been quite confident. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Especially when it comes to boxing. When you go sparring at someone else's gym, I remember my dad saying once, he was quite worried. He was like, do you want me to come with you? I said, Dad, walk into a boxing gym with a gym bag and a bad attitude. You, you get a lot of respect just by doing that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> walk in the gym, fist pump everyone, have a bit of an attitude about you, get in there and do the rounds. The, you have a lot people have a lot of respect for you when you do things like that yeah that's true 100 percent true and uh yeah i mean like i say it's it, the other beautiful thing about a gym everyone's equal in there as well you get people from all different backgrounds as well and uh, people are mixing in and things like that and it's you know it, it really is an amazing thing to see yes. to be part of so um while we're on the topic of you training and coaching people and all that your advice for people starting out in boxing i think this could be quite interesting because um, what you were saying about the amateur thing earlier and all that type of stuff. You know, your advice of a few things to do, a few things not to do. I know it's a pretty big question, so we'll have to narrow it down to okay. a couple of things. But, yeah, somebody who wants to make a go of it, 
um, do it the right way. Maybe some lessons you've learned the the right way. Maybe some the hard way as well. You yeah, pass on to a young um, a young gun, basically starting out. You know, that's a basically the first thing I'd say is you've got to just do it. You you can't sit there outside of the gym on the Monday, and then go to the door on the Tuesday, and then think about going in on the Wednesday. You've just got to go in. No one's in the no one in there is going to be nudging and oh, look at the new kid here. This, this, is, this is fodder here to beat up because a proper respectful gym, which most gyms are, won't treat you like that. You know, they'll not put you anywhere where you're not meant to be. They'll not, they'll not mistreat you. They'll not use you as fodder. Do you know what I mean? Just go in there. The, the hardest thing is, it's like they say about going to, going to the gym or starting a diet. Just the hardest thing is starting it. Once you started it, you're all right. You get that first two days of a diet done. You're on then. You're flowing. You're flowing. And it's the same with the boxing gym. Just go in, get them gloves on, get your skipping rope. Obviously, get your skipping rope first, then put your gloves on. <laughs> and then um, just get just get stuck in, listen to your coaches. You know, like the... Because we know what we're on about. We've been there, we've done it. Do you know what I mean? Just listen to your coaches, get in there, and just get stuck in. You'll never forgive yourself if you give up. That's what I always say. When we're doing, we do plank for two minutes at the end of most of my sessions. And I'll say, you're a minute and 35 seconds into it now. You've got 25 seconds left. You'll never forgive yourself if you give up now. It's just the same thing. You'll never forgive yourself if you give up. Just keep going. Keep going. Yeah. It's an, it's an amazing lesson for life as well as uh, for boxing as well. I think you can apply that for a lot of things people are doing. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Diet. Boxing boxing changed my mindset on so many things. Yeah. So many things. It, I was quite a uh, rambunctious and quite, you know, quite. I was, I was a little shit, basically. I was a little shit, and even into my early twenties, to my mid twenties, I was still a bit of a knob. Do you know what I mean? And then boxing gave me a little bit of discipline, and it gave me that sense of achievement, and it gave me that never say die, never give up kind of attitude. And I know that's dead corny and dead, dead rocky kind of sounding, but. It genuinely does. It genuinely does. If you if you're really really tired on a run, and you do that extra mile to get home without stopping, that's just a, a little win. Even if it's not part of training camp, it's just a little win in life. Just a little thing of I didn't stop. I'm proud of myself. You know what I mean? Just things like that. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, the self respect side of things is. I yes, think the most important type of respect that, that matters really, you know. I mean, of course it is. People can say this, that, and the other, but when you look in the mirror, you know what you see looking back. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, get, I totally I get where you're coming from. That's a big part of what's amazing about the sport, you know. And like I say, how it applies to life, other life areas as well. Any area of life really is, you know. I'm glad we've hit that one home. Um, let's talk about the bare knuckle side of things a little bit. Okay. You know, because we need to touch on that. After everything you've achieved, giving that a go. What was the inspiration for that in the beginning? What what gave you that idea? So I started training Dan McGrath during lockdown, just as we kind of opened up from lockdown. Dan, uh, do you know Dan McGrath? Have you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, um, I beg your pardon. I've just finished my tea before we started recording, so I do, do apologise. <laughs> no um, worries. I started training Dan. He came back from Blackpool and he needed a coach. Um, so we, I was doing back garden sessions at that point. It was, you know sneaking around a little bit in lockdown, trying to earn a living. And um, started training Dan, and then um, he signed for BKB, which is who I fight for now, BKB TM. Um, but before that, he had two fights for another organisation, and um, he had a British title fight coming up, and he said, I need a coach. So I said, right, come round. Um, so I started coaching Dan. He kind of trusted me with that fight, and we, 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 we won it. We won it. Well, he won it. But we, we as a team won it in about 11, 12 seconds, knocked him out. And then after that, he got a shot at the European. He won that in three rounds. And then after that, he signed for BKB and he won the world title in the first round. So that's where, that's what led me into burn up, into the burn up scene. And with regards to the fighting, I was, with regards to coming back and fighting again, I was just, I was at the O2 with Dan for the show when he won his world title. And I liked the magnitude of it. I liked the spectacle. Do you know what I mean? And I just thought, have I still got something left? So I kind of did three weeks of what would be a training camp. And I did a bit of sparring and I did a bit of... I'd always sparred. I'd always had a little knockabout anyway with the lads. But I, I took it like like I'm in camp, kind of serious. 
and I thought I'm going to give it a go. So I spoke to Jim and Joe who run BKB and they sent me a three year, they watched me on the pods and stuff and they sent me a three year contract. So I've got two years left of that now. Wow, that is cool, man. So you just, you saw Dan doing it, you're like, right, I want a piece of that action. I want yeah. to do that. And it was just, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And you know what? I wish I'd have found it 10 years earlier because I prefer it. And I know that sounds absolutely backward to prefer getting a hit with no gloves on, but I genuinely, genuinely do. I prefer it. I prefer it to glove box. I, I love glove boxing. You know what I mean? I'm not saying glove boxing is no shit because I found this, you know. I, I love glove boxing. I love it. It's a massive part of my life. It's a massive, it's got a piece of my soul in a way, but. I do genuinely prefer it as we sit here today to, to glove to the burnacle. Yeah, that's cool. I can, I can get my head around it, but let's go yeah. a, bit, a little bit deeper into that, though, because I think this is this is a cool topic for people. Yeah, I mean, go a bit deeper into that, please. What you love about it versus glove boxing. I mean, it's obviously, as you say, one's not better than the other, but there's obviously differences, big differences, uh, some similarities as well. In yeah. Words, looking at it from that point of view, sort of, comparing the two sports if you like because you've competed yeah. both just your thoughts on that i mean i know that's that's quite a big topic. i mean i'm i'm very much i like contact in in boxing terms i'm an inside fighter i like being in to to sound like it i i don't particularly like boxing like fencing and i like being in i like scrapping in a way you know like educated scrapping you know i like i like the contact of being inside i like head on head trading punches with someone and it was in a respectful way, obviously, and that's more what Burnuckle is. Because as I got into Burnuckle, I, I, I tr I've tried to be too clever about it. I've tried to. Boxing's a massive part of it, but it, it's there's just a few little differences that you kind of got to take boxing away from it as well. You kind of got to make it more of a scrap. You're just going to be more educated with how you scrap. Does that make sense? <laughs> do you know what I mean I get where you're coming from yeah 100% the head movement and stuff all still needs to come into it but you've not got the parry you've not got the block the same it's just little things like that when, when I first fought and I thought mm, I need to change some things here do you know what I mean so that's the main differences that I've noticed but yes. it's all good I, I genuinely genuinely genuine love it I love it and what about your thoughts on the debate of which one uh, is actually sort of more painful or which one you have to be tougher? Because obviously, um, I don't think, I think both sports, you know, you have to be very tough, you have to be very skilled, you have to have a lot of different things, you have to have the IQ going on in different ways. But yeah. being hit with a glove, being hit with a bare fist, it just in terms of a sensation now, uh, people always want to know about this in my interviews, when bare knuckle comes into it. What are your, your thoughts on that side of it? Not I've not really noticed the difference because I spar with some heavy-handed lads anyway, do you know what I mean? So sometimes when you're sparring with them lads in 12, 14-ounce gloves, you can feel like you're getting cracked with a burn knuckle anyway. We have a, a, a Latvian lad in the gym called Atmos. Um, he's, 30, he's about 13 and a half, 14 so on, and he's the youngest of eight brothers from Latvia. So you can imagine the scraps he's had. And I've honestly, he's probably the... He's probably up there with top five people who's hit me hardest in my life. He hits so hard. So when I've got in with anyone who doesn't hit like Atlas, it's like, oh, this is this is just a bonus. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't hit as hard as him because he hits so hard, Liam. So hard, so powerful. Um, but the argument with Burnuckle and boxing is the Burnuckle punch knocks you out straight away, whereas boxing, you might take six or seven extra ones that you don't need to take. Like the cuts come straight away in burn up and stuff like that. It looks more aesthetically gruesome. It's, it's, it's only a cut. Do you know what I mean? It's nothing. People look like the, the face is being ripped off and it's not. It's just a cut above the eye that seats around the face. Don't worry about it. Towel, done. Yeah. People get so stressed out. It's just a bit of blood. Don't worry about it. It's all right. It's just blood. Well, that's the thing, isn't it, though? I mean, like you say, aesthetically, visually, I mean, it appears mm. more brutal, but. Yeah, like you say, that's what I was getting at, really, is, is the fight yeah. over quicker, you know, one punch. But yeah, with the boxing, having that endurance of taking the punishment for a longer time, that's probably one of the key differences. And um, it's cool to get your thoughts on that, because there is a lot of that debate back and forth, people saying burn up was safer, you know, some people saying it's not. If I'm, if I'm going to take a shot flush on the chin, I'd rather take it with no gloves on and get knocked out straight away, rather than take a shot flush on the chin, be wobbled, and then take five or six around the brain. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, the, that one in Burnock will knock you out whereas that one in boxing 
and then the three, four, five, six that come after it as well. Eubank Watson is a prime example because if it had got him, if it had got him early on with that uppercut, apologies. If it had got him early on with that uppercut, it would have knocked him out. But he got him in the twelfth round with it, where his brain was already damaged. So yeah. it's a good example of it. McClellan, McClellan and Ben, same thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it does show, same as you, I love glove boxing, I love uh, the sport, you know, and I, I don't have a preference personally between bare knuckle and glove boxing, but that aspect is there. I've, I've met Michael Watson as well. And when you see the damage, <laughs> yeah, yeah, lovely man, really nice man. But when, when you uh, see the damage that's been done, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, I met Eubank as well. And when he tells the story about, uh, you know, what he did to Michael Watson, having to live with that afterwards as well. It's, yeah. It's heavy. I mean, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's not a reflection on, on the sport at all. But um, I get where you're coming from. Their brains are just being shaken around like a martini. I'd, I'd rather be knocked out with one punch than be wobbled and then have six around the brain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's a selfish sport as well, though. Boxing, burn knuckle. All combat sports are selfish because you're, you're thinking about nothing but yourself. When am I next running? When am I next eating? When am I next training? What? How many tickets have I sold? It's so selfish. It's so selfish. You've got to kind of compartmentalise it and think, right, this is Saturday. I've got my children. I'm not thinking about that boxing till tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? It, it it's a self, it's selfish. It's a hard sport. It's, it's hard as a family man to to uh, to compete in it. But I, I I love it. I just love it. I can't let it go just yet. Yeah, rightly or wrong. Yeah, no, I can tell. I mean, your face just lights up when you're talking about it. You know what I mean? And it's, yeah. It's, I love the passion, to be honest. I mean, it, yeah, I can really feel your passion for the sport and everything like that. Let's touch on that as well um, before we go back. I'll come back to the Bernacle now. But when it comes to training through your boxing career and for Bernacle as well, around life, you know, around family, around coaching. Yeah. So you're in the gym a lot anyway, from what I can get. Yeah, yeah. But just walking through your regime, basically, and a little bit of what you do day to day, I think it would be interesting for people to, to know about. So, well, like a kind of training camp or just my day in general, just kind of week. Well, let's talk about it from both sides of like uh, when you're training generally just for, for the enjoyment of it and then when you're going into a camp yeah, uh, yeah. and stepping it up. Let's, but yeah, we'll probably have to touch on both sides to be fair. Tra training in general, it like we could call it tick over training, don't they? So training in general, I'll just I'll just kind of message the lads on a Tuesday afternoon. Fancy a spar tonight, lads, we'll have a knock about and then Thursday might do a bit of pads. Friday might do a bit of running. Do you know what I mean? I don't really have a regime when I'm just ticking over. I'll just see what's happening. Are you lot in the group chat? Are you lot in tonight? Fancy a few rounds, yeah. Whereas when I've when I'm in camp, I try and run six times a week, seven times a week, sometimes twice a day, and then I have two to three days of strength and conditioning, a day for sparring, two days for pads. So I'm training twice a day most days. I train once on a Friday. I don't train on a Saturday because I have the kids and I train once on a Sunday. But Monday to Thursday, I usually train twice a day, running and then pads or strength and conditioning or sparring. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. uh, it's hectic to fit it in around the kids and stuff like that. But you, when you want to do something, you make time for it, don't you? 100% you do. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. If I didn't want to do it, I'd just make an excuse that I've not got the time, but I want to do it, so I make time for it get up half an hour earlier and stuff, you know. Yeah, that's what you've got to do, 100%. Good life lesson right there as well, you know. Um, and the mental side of it as well, this is something people don't see. Obviously, you love it. Obviously, you've been doing this a long time. Mm -hmm. On the build up to a fight, maybe, you know, maybe when we're getting close, like in the fight week itself, what's mm -hmm. on your mind, like on, on the build up or right before, that type of thing? See, it's weird that we touch on this because usually I have a very, I live quite, I live quite a stoic life, do you know what I mean? I'm quite chilled and I just kind of let stuff pass me by, do you know what I mean? I try, people will, will watch and laugh this because they know I don't like on social media, but I try not to have an opinion on stuff, do you know what I mean? I just think if it doesn't concern me, I'm not interested. You know what I mean, people like, I don't, I don't really gossip, do you know what I mean? I'm not. And I kind of kind of apply that to, to training camp. It's like, oh, I don't worry about what the guy who unboxing is doing. I'm just worrying what I'm doing. Do you know what I mean? When am I sparring? Again, going back to the selfish side of it, what am I doing? When am I doing that? Blah, blah, blah. But um, with regards to mindset, I just I just stay just stay switched on, stay focused. But my mindset was what lost me my last burn off the fight because I had a conversation with my youngest daughter's mum Um 10 days before the fight and it was like a conversation about how my daughter had been really upset at night missing me and stuff like that and I remember being sat on bed 
and it just took all the fight out of me. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want to go and have a fight because it, it was my weekend on with the kids when the fight fell, so I had to arrange childcare and I knew the kids had been missing me when I was in London. It just kind of took the fight out of me. I was just like, I don't want to have a fight. I, I think I'll just, I'd rather just get us all a takeaway and just chill on the couch. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want to go to London and have a fight. Whereas the one before that, I was like, for want, for want of a better phrase, I was ready to hurt someone. Do you know what I mean? And I put in a really good performance. My second fight wasn't a good performance. Not taking any away from Aaron. Aaron did what he had to do to beat the guy in front of him, which is what fighters do. It's what, exactly what a fighter was meant to do. If Aaron, if it had been on the flip side and Aaron had, had a bad week, I had to beat him. I was there to beat him. So I take nothing away from him. I just, from my point of view, I wasn't the best fighter I could be on that night. Yeah. So. Well, it happens, doesn't it? I mean, this is a thing that comes up again and again when I do these interviews. A lot of times, people's toughest fights or some of the fights, like what you're saying, that didn't go their way, it's often something outside the ring. It's often yeah, absolutely. with, you know, what's going on in the gym, what's going on between the ropes, none of that absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. You know. Because that training camp, I was arguably, even at 38 years of age, the best I'd ever, ever, ever been. Me and, me and my team were like, I was ready two weeks out, do you know what I mean? They were like, you're going to school him. So you're going to absolutely play with him. And then that phone call, I, I remember it being sat on my bed. And I was looking, I remember looking at my chest of drawers and I just felt the fight leave me. Do you know what I mean? I literally, like a physical motion. I felt it like, oh my God, it's gone. <laughs> I felt it go. I fuck, excuse me. I felt it go. I was like, oh, but we got there in the end. Yeah, you live and learn. I mean, this is the thing. It's, it's uh, yes. never going to be perfect because life does happen. And, you know... Yeah, yeah. You know, nothing's perfect. No, in, uh, no injuries and we're all good. Every fighter's got injuries. Look at the state where you have to put your body through. You're not telling me about a fighter doesn't go into there with some sort of niggle. Even if you're not injured as such, you've got a niggle. You've got something. Look at what you're putting your body through for eight weeks. You're not telling me your body just goes after a week off. Right, we're ready to go now, mate. Do you know what I mean? I'm falling bits, mate. I'm falling to bits. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's it. It does take its toll, but you obviously love it, so it's... it's uh, exactly. You know, worth it. Necessary. It's a necessary evil. It's a labour of love, as they say. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I can really feel that vibe from you in, in a, like, a really cool way, you know? Yeah. They, they, there's the, there are these sort of corny quotes out there of, like, you know... Um, do a job you, you learn you never have to work a day in your life and it's yeah, yeah. Thing. but with with yourself honestly i do get that vibe but like in a really good way with the enthusiasm you have for what you do and everything and obviously it's like anything you do in life there's good times there's bad times there's things that yeah. you feel but you, you you obviously love it and that's just that's just cool man i hope you always keep that passion i do i do it no, nobody wants to go to work Liam. let's be honest nobody wants to go to work but i'd rather go to work holding pads for my mates and getting paid for doing my hobby than going, not to disrespect anyone, stacking shelves at Tesco or packing boxes at Amazon. Do you know what I mean? And I don't, I mean, I appreciate people have to earn a living and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but I'm fortunate enough that I've got a skill inside my head where I can make make well, make a living from it. Do you know what I mean? So, and I'm just surrounded by my mates all day. I can't really grumble. I do grumble. I'm a bit of a miserable sort, but <laughs> I do, we all find something to grumble about, but my hobby's my job. I can't really moan. No. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, because I've seen this uh, Mr. Grumpy thing or something on Facebook or some joke about that somewhere. But yeah. Talking to you now, like it's 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 hard to believe, to be fair. But you know, I just hope we all have those. It, uh... It's it's a gr it's a grumpy kind of persona. Do you know what I mean? People say you're miserable. You, I'm not miserable. I'm not I've got nothing to be miserable about. I'm just grumpy. There's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't sleep very well and I train very hard. I'm just grumpy. <laughs> There's a difference to being miserable and grumpy. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, yeah, there's probably just a little bit of fatigue in there or something, and it does. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does take its toll, you know. I mean, because you're fitting a lot in. That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, on the subject of which fitting a lot in, obviously your future plans in in Bernacle, We need to touch on that as well. You know what you got coming up now with this. I don't mind how far ahead you want to go. If you want to go yeah. close, or if you want to go far, or whatever. But just your sort of dreams, plans, and goals from here with that. When I, when I signed with BKB, we obviously all of the dreams of being a world champion. We have the aspirations of being a world champion, British champion or whatever, picking up belts, picking up medals. I've cut, I retired about six, seven months ago. And then I've come back because my circumstances have changed a little bit. My life's changed a little bit. I've 
offloaded a few things that needed offloading to give me some, give me more positive mindset. So I've decided to come back fighting again. Um, I'm just looking fight to fight now, just fight to fight. So I'll, on 16th of September, at the O2 is my next fight. I've not got an opponent named yet, so I'm, I'm just looking to that. Just training for that, get to 76 kilos for that, have that fight, wake up in the morning, get home, see the kids, make a plan from there. That's all I'm doing, just a fight at a time. Because I had the I had the dreams of being a world champion and all that, which I still I still hold. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying I'm here to be a journeyman in Burnacle. I'm not. I'm I'm here, I'm here to win fights, but just just a fight at a time. Just just like when you're learning to box, just a punch at a time. Just one training session at a time. This is all it is for me in the minute. Just one camp, one fight at a time, and we'll take it from the. I might have this one. I feel like I've redeemed myself and retire. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I mean? I just. One at a time, Liam. One at a time. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you know, see what feels right for you. And exactly. Uh, like, I mean, you've done a lot with obviously club boxing and then moving over to Ben Apple as well. So I mean, you've sort of got that, got yourself in that position to take in a fight at a time as well. And yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. From with that, so fair enough. I mean, I'd like to say, as somebody in terms of watching the fights and everything, I hope you have a, a few more, a couple more, whatever, but taking it a fight at a time, it's, a, it's always a good policy, you know, how that goes, anything can, uh, anything. And it, I could get an offer for anything, I could get offered, you know, say somebody gets injured and I could offer, offer to fight for a world title tomorrow, I'm not going to turn it down, but I'm also not aiming towards, right, I'm going to win this one, win this one, then I'm going to fight for a world title, I'll just get in the ring, fall this, get in the ring, fall this fight, see how I get on with it, and take it from the, yeah. Get thin, get fat, get thin, get fat, get thin, get fat. Just repeat that until I retire. Yeah, that's the way. I'm in, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle at the minute. I'm in somewhere in the middle. Yeah, man, that's that's fair enough. But um, so that's the future plans there. What was the other thing? Something popped into my head. Oh yeah, yeah. People you'd like to thank who've helped you along the way. I often give give this a quick uh, a quick mention just because, um, obviously. I think it's interesting for you because you're sort of helping a lot of other people to achieve yeah. their dreams, whether they're, like you said earlier, whether they want to be professional, go all the way, whether they just want to lose a bit of weight, everything in between. So you're helping them. But in terms of people who've given you um, a helping hand when you needed it, obviously with, with the glove side of things, with the burnout side of things, with anything, any names you throw out there for that just to say a, a thank you? There might be too many to, to name here, yeah, but... Well, my first coach always stands out, Paul. Paul Cunliffe, he always stands out to me because obviously he, he took me under his wing because I was just training myself, really, thinking I was Floyd Mayweather. And then he came over to the punch bag one day and said, you're shit, get on these pads. <laughs> and he turned me into a pretty good fighter, you know what I mean? So I always I always give Paul a shout out. Um, Sam, my coach at the minute, Sam at Lambert. Padman Sam, Satnav Sam, he's, he has various names. Samuel L. Padman. That's <laughs> Samuel L. Padman is my favourite one for him. He has various, uh, he has various monikers. Um, I always thank Sam because he gives up, gives up a lot of his time. He comes to the gym three nights a week, and he's just had a baby, and so he comes down to look after me three nights a week. So I always appreciate that from him, and I appreciate his girlfriend as well, Faye, his fiance, letting him out of the house for three nights a week to come deal with my ugly mug. Um, my sponsor, one of my main sponsors, Steve. Steve, um, Stephen Daly at Hearn Group. He he always sees me right. He always sorts me my accommodation and everything when I'm in London. Um, and just everyone, just just the kids, Mia Harper and Lila. Hello to my kids. And just everyone who just everyone who helps me out. Kev Harper, let's use the gym. There is a lot to mention. I could go on all day because I, I do appreciate what a lot of people do for me. But um, just everyone who's ever helped me along the way, I, I do appreciate it. I'm not always a uh, not always vocal with it, but. It's all in the for the day. I uh, pack it all in. Yeah, it's good to give them a mention because obviously you're all in in this together. If you like, you're all in life together and working. Yeah. Like, um, the outside world. There's a lot of people sort of behind the scenes. You know, with yeah, yeah, yeah. with coaches and things. So it's good just to give that a little mention. So the last couple of things, and then we'll wrap this up to uh, yeah. let you crack on with your evening. No and problem. You said earlier you uh, you try not to have opinions on things that, that don't bother you and all this type of thing, but. A couple of sort of broader topics with boxing. I just want to ask you because of how long you've been around the game and you have a very good boxing brain. First of all, influence of boxing and that stuff that's going on at the moment. Do you rate it? Do you not rate it? Do you think it's good for the sport or do you think it's 
terrible or it's not a black or white issue in your mind i just i just think we need to take it for what it is it's just it's just entertainment that's all it is it's not boxing it's entertainment Terence Crawford versus Errol Spence in a couple of weeks that is boxing that is boxing at its finest KSI versus Joe Fournier is just entertainment so take it for what it is it's just entertainment just enjoy it I don't mind it mate it's, it's a laugh isn't it do you know what I mean I mean some of it's absolutely awful some of them couldn't box eggs for Tesco's do you know what I mean but it's just entertainment it's just like someone getting on stage with a guitar and singing or someone doing a magic trick it's just entertainment just and if you don't like it, don't watch it. If you if you like influencer boxing, you don't like real boxing. Don't watch Errol Spence versus Terence Crawford. And if you like real boxing but you don't like influencer boxing, watch Errol Spence versus Ter- Terence Crawford. And don't watch KSI versus Joe Fournier. It's dead easy. Just ignore it. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that, man. That's pretty much. Well, I don't mind it, mate. It's just yeah. everyone's making a quid. They can't fight for shit. They can't fight for toffees, and they're getting paid millions for it. I'd do it. Yeah. So would you. So would 95% of the people watching this. <laughs> it's a good way to look at it, man. I, yeah, I'm with you on that. And um, in terms of boxing itself, professional boxing now, proper boxing as a sport, um, it's a pretty big topic, this. But yeah. what would you say, let's look at it this way. What would you say would be one or two positive changes you've seen in uh, your time as a, as a fighter? Or maybe one or two things that you don't like um where boxing's going as well just to sort of balance it out with the scales i know it's a very big question but i'd like i'd like to do something about judging i think we need to do something about judging actively as a as a as a community all of us amateur boxing professional boxing everything i think something needs to be done about judging because cambosas versus maxi Hughes at the weekend maxi Hughes won that fight eight rounds to four seven rounds to five you could argue for a draw but Max Hughes, Max Hughes won the fight and he did get it because it was a top rank show and george cambosas is a top rank fighter in Oklahoma, it, it we, we need to have impartial judging. Um, I'd like to see less of these interim belts and regular belts and stuff like that. I think when it, I think the governing bodies need to some sort some like amalgamate somewhere. It's like right, we all come together and we all sanction one fight, or we all come together and we all we all are the the world boxing um, whatever world boxing panoramic something. Do you know what I mean? And all the belts go to one, so there's one champion per weight. I think I think something needs to be done about that because it's holding up the sport. Fury Fury holding up the sport like now. You can't blame him because he wants pay. Do you know what I mean? He's got four hundred and eighty five thousand kids, hasn't he? So so he wants he wants paying, do you know what I mean? And I understand it. I've got three kids. You know, I, I, if someone said to me you can fight this guy for five and a half million, or you can fight this guy for fifteen million, I'm gonna go and fight the other guy for fifteen million. I've got kids to feed. I get it, but I don't necessarily agree with it. So we all want to see undisputed, but if we go back to the thing and amalgamate all the belts, there's no such thing as undisputed because there's one champion per weight. Everyone has to fight each other to be a world champion. So that's what I'd change. Some positive changes, obviously, I think, in healthcare, stuff like that. Healthcare's really gone, really gone on the up, like right down to ringside. You know, pro boxing shows, there's always a trauma team on hand at the nearest hospital and stuff like that. I think that's always a positive change because obviously it's a dangerous sport at the end of the day dangerous for a lot of people everyone involved so any any in, in improvements on health care and health provisions is always a good thing in boxing so that that's what I, that's that's my broad take on things yeah absolutely it's some good topics then i know it's something it's a very very big subject i mean we could be here until next week oh. This yes, just well, I, you know picking your brains on a couple of key things i think is very cool as i say because of your expertise basically i mean how long you've been around it yeah you know so um good all right well i think that's pretty much a wrap i mean we've talked about some good things i appreciate your time very much uh very welcome mate no problem at all um, and like i said at the beginning i appreciate you being an open book as well and just sharing everything uh, yeah nothing nothing to hide me mate yeah 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 nothing to hide Thank you very much, and I'll be uh, cheering for you in your next Bernacle or, you know, whatever comes next. Good luck with it. Best of luck with it. I know one fight at a time, but uh, September, good luck for that as well. Just to put that Thank in. you very much, Leah. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel, and there'll be more videos coming soon.